Okay, so now we are ready for chapter four. This is a good chapter. Lots of writing also. That's the spirit. Chapter four. Congratulatory. From the dimly lighted passages of the court, the last sediment of the human stew that had been boiling there all day was straining off. When Dr. Manette, Lucy Manette, his daughter, Mr. Lorry, the solicitor for the defense, and its counsel, Mr. Stryber, stood gathered round Mr. Charles Darnay, just released, congratulating him on his escape from death. Okay, so you underlined human stew that had been boiling. Now please put a green M for metaphor by human stew. Isn't that a clever metaphor for Dickens to use? I think of stew with meat, potatoes, carrots, a bay leaf, tomato, you know. And here we have a human stew, not that I'm wanting to eat human. I am not, but I'm just trying to say, what a clever metaphor. And you might have already written this annotation because I think it was in those annotations that you copied down. But in case you did not, at the bottom of the page, you can put spectators in the courtroom. Spectators in the courtroom at the bottom of page 79. Spectators in the courtroom. Okay, so outside the court then are all the people high-fiving, celebrating Charles Darnay that he was acquitted instead of convicted. It would have been difficult by a far brighter light to recognize in Dr. Manette, intellectual of face and upright of bearing, the shoemaker of the garret in Paris. Yet no one could have looked at him twice without looking again, even though the opportunity of observation had not extended to the mournful cadence of his low, grave voice and to the abstraction that overclouded him fitfully without any apparent reason. While one external cause, and that a reference to his long lingering long agony, lingering would always, agony. as on the trial, evoke this condition from the depths of his soul, it was also in its nature to arise of itself, and to draw Charles a gleam of him as incomprehensible now. to those unacquainted with his story as if they had seen the shadow of the actual Bastille thrown upon him by a summer sun when the substance was 300 miles away. Okay, so that paragraph was telling us that when you look at Dr. Manette, Mostly you see a man who is happy, but occasionally he is really subject to deep depression, to these bouts of depression, especially when he remembers his long lingering agony. What is that a reference to? How much time in prison? 18 years. When he is forced to remember and dwell on that, like when he showed up in the courtroom to testify, to give testimony, then it can plunge him into depression. Get ready to underline. Only his daughter had the power of charming this black brooding from his mind. She, she was, was the golden, golden thread that united thread, him to a past beyond one. his misery, into a present beyond his misery. And the sound of her voice, the light of her face, the touch of her hand, had a strong beneficial influence with him almost always. Not absolutely always, for she could recall some occasions on which her power had failed, but they were few and slight, and she believed them over. Okay, so that superscript one, she was the golden thread. At the top of your page, please write this note. That golden thread suggests both her blonde hair and her life-giving influence. Her blonde hair and her life-giving influence. Now, if you're interested in earning a piece of candy, I don't have the greatest candy in the world, but it is candy. It would be your choice of a peppermint, which is pretty lame, <laughs> or a Three Musketeers bar, which is probably also pretty lame. I don't like either one of them, but um, here is your chance. Look at the very next line of text. You can put your and down, Jacob, temporarily. And if you know the answer, if you think you know the answer to this question, you can put your hand up. Mr. Darnay had kissed her hand 
fervently and gratefully. I'm asking which one word in that line lets us know that Mr. Darnay likes Lucy. Okay. Haley, yours is the first hand I saw. Fervently. Fervently. Oh, yes, that is exactly right. Because gratefully means, oh, I'm so thankful to have you here. Fervently means more than one kiss. Oh, yeah. Fervent. Okay, very good. Which do you want? Peppermint or chocolate? Chocolate. Okay. All right. We will get going. Okay, so circle Mr. Darnay, circle Mr. Striver, and you're going to undermine a whole lot in this paragraph. Mr. Darnay had kissed her hand fervently and gratefully, and had turned to Mr. Striver, whom he warmly attacked. Mr. Striver, a man of little more than 30, more but than 30 years older than he was, stout, stout loud, loud, red, red bluff, bluff, and free from any drawback of delicacy, had a pushing way of shouldering, shouldering himself, himself morally himself. and physically into companies and conversations that argued well for his shouldering his way up in life. Okay, I didn't have you undermine something else because it's too hard to say it while the tape is going. Mr. Striver is 30 years old but he acts 20 years older. He's obnoxious. He's stout, loud, red, bluff. Please underline, free from any drawback of delicacy. Free from any drawback of delicacy. This is Dickens's sarcasm coming out. He's saying that Mr. Striver doesn't have the drawback or disadvantage of being delicate. In other words, he doesn't have the disadvantage of being polite. So Mr. Striver is obnoxious, crude. In fact, you can put down at the bottom this part right here. Striver is loud, pushy, crude. You also need to write at the bottom of the page connotation of name. Check up down here at the bottom of this page. Because I've told you before, Dickens chooses his character names purposely. He has a reason for naming this character Striver. And, lest I forget to tell you, every other time in this book, you hear the term shouldering, you should underline it. Because every time Dickens uses that for Mr. Striver, he's talking about the word Bully. If someone shoulders his way into conversation, he pushes him, himself into a conversation, shoulders other people out. That's what that's talking about. The other thing I wanted to say was that the, about the connotation. If we think of a person who is a striver, what do we imagine that person striving for? Perfection. So, are you saying success? I can't really hear. Yeah. Climbing the ladder of success, striving for success, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you do y'all even know that term climbing the ladder of no. success? No, yeah. not really. Yeah. Some of you do. Okay, so a person who's climbing the ladder of success, in this case, he's also trying to kick the other people that are climbing that same ladder to kick them off because he's a bully, right? Are you getting this? Yes. Striver, connotation and name. Okay, so let's continue. He still had his wig and gown on, and he said, squaring himself at his late client to that degree that he squeezed the innocent Mr. Laurie clean out of the group. I'm glad to have brought you off with honor, Mr. Darnay. It was an infamous prosecution, grossly infamous, but not the less likely to succeed on that count. You have laid me under an obligation to you for life in two senses said his late client taking his hand i have done my best for you mr donnie and my best is as good as another man's i believe it clearly being incumbent on someone to say much better mr Laurie said it perhaps not quite disinterestedly but with the interested object of squeezing himself back again do you think so said mr striver well you have been present all day and you ought to know you are a man of business too and as such quoth mr Laurie whom the counsel learned in the law had now shouldered back into the group, just as he had previously shouldered him out of it. As such, I will appeal to Dr. Manette to break up this conference and order us all to our homes. If Miss Lucy looks ill. Mr. Darnay has had a terrible day. We are worn out. 
Speak for yourself, Mr. Lorry, said Stryver. I have a night's work to do, yes? Speak for yourself. I speak for myself, answered Mr. Lorry, and for Mr. Darney, and for Miss Lucy. And, Miss Lucy, do you not think I may speak for us all? He asked her the question pointedly and with a glance at her father. One of my favorite parts in the book, really, one of my very favorite paragraphs is about to come up. So I just want to make sure you're understanding what's going on. We're gathered outside the courtroom, probably standing in a little tight-knit circle. We've been congratulating, congratulating Darnay that he's free, that he's a free man. And so the scene is there's Mr. Stryver, the defense attorney, Mr. Lori. Um, Charles Darnay, Dr. Lynette, and Lucy. Those are the five people in this circle. It's hugely important. Mr. Lori has just said, hey, we need to break this up. We need to all go home. Everybody's talking. Lucy's tired. Darnay, you've been through so much. And then he stops and he says, hey, Lucy, don't you think especially that we should break up? Because he's looking at whom? Um, he asked her the question pointedly. Yes. Now, look at this next paragraph. His face had become frozen, as it were, in a very curious look at Darnay, an intent look, deepening into a frown of dislike and distrust, not even unmixed with fear. With this strange expression on him, his thoughts had wandered away. That is huge. Put brackets around that paragraph. Also put a star or an asterisk beside that paragraph. And now we're going to underline what makes this paragraph hugely important. So who's standing right beside Charles Darnay? Dr. Manette. So as he is standing so close to this person, he's probably never been this close to that person before because he's looking at him. And as he does, undermine very curious look at Darnay. Underline that. Very curious look at Darnay. Underline frown of dislike and distrust. We're on page 81. Frown of dislike and distrust and underline with fear. And with your green pen, you should put C for clue in the margin. And let me tell you why that is so huge. You tell me. Here's how old is Dr. Manette? 50. 50. That's right. How old is this person he's staring at with dislike, distrust, and fear? 25. Now the lawyer's 30. The defendant that he's staring at with dislike, distrust, and fear is 25 years old. Now let's do some math here. How long ago was Dr. Manette put into prison? No, it's not 18. Because it was 18 plus 25 because it, this happened five years ago. So a total of 23 years, right? So how old was the 25-year-old defendant 23 years ago? Two. Two. So then why would Dr. Manette be looking at this guy with a face of dislike? distrust and fear. Do you get it? Because could Charles Darnay have done anything to Dr. Manette in his past? No, not a two year old. They could not have hurt him so badly. So that establishes one of the overall mysteries of this book that is not solved until almost the very last page. And you will definitely have forgotten about this by the time we get there. And that's why I really want you to remember it. And now go ahead and write this note. I would start at the top of the page. I tried to shrink it down. I tried not to make you write all that I did. But please write this. Evidently, the sight of Darnay is somehow related to an event 
in Dr. Manette's past. It's hard to imagine how, but evidently, the site of Darnay is somehow related to an event in Dr. Manette's past. My father, said Lucy, softly laying her hand on his. He slowly shook the shadow off and turned to her. Shall we go home, my father? With a long breath, he answered, yes. The friends of the acquitted prisoner had dispersed under the impression which he himself had originated that he would not be released that night. The lights were nearly all extinguished in the passages. The iron gates were being closed with a jar and a rattle, and the dismal place was deserted until tomorrow morning's interest of gallows, pillory, whipping post, and branding iron should repeople it. Walking between her father and Mr. Darnay, Lucy Manette passed into the open air. A hackney coach was called, and the father and daughter departed. Mr. Stryber had left them in the passages to shoulder his way back to the roping room. Another person who had not joined the group or interchanged. Hey guys, if I had my clipboard, which I guess I'm going to need to get, I only saw three people under mine just now shoulder his way. On the previous page, I saw just two or three people. You've missed many shoulders. You've got to pay attention. This book is too hard to just kind of zone in and out at random. Binged a word with any of them, but who had been leaning against the wall where its shadow was darkest, had silently strolled out after the rest and had looked on until the coach drove away. He now stepped up to where Mr. Lorry and Mr. Darnay stood upon the pavement. Okay. In the middle of the paragraph we just finished, I want you to underline in red, leaning against the wall where its shadow was darkest. Superscript one. Leaning against the wall where its shadow is darkest. And I want you to write this very long note. You can start it at the top of the page, but you're probably going to have to write it on the side. You remember the guy who scribbled something on the sheet of paper, wadded it up, and tossed it to the defense attorney and was largely responsible for Charles Darnay getting acquitted? The guy who looks similar to him, that's his name. Carton seems to shun, that means avoid, the limelight or spotlight. He's the very opposite of Striver. Carton almost enjoys keeping his talents concealed as though to punish himself for the mess he has made of his life. And that's why he wasn't with the others when they were celebrating and congratulating Darnay. He was all by himself. He, you're going to see him in action. He's a bit of a jerk. So, Mr. Lorry, men of business may speak to Mr. Darnay now. Nobody had made any acknowledgement of Mr. Carton's part in the day's proceedings. Nobody had known of it. He was unrobed and was none the better for it in appearance. If you knew what a conflict goes on in the business mind, when the business mind is divided between good natured impulse and business appearances, he would be amused, Mr. Darnay. Mr. Lorry reddened and said warmly, you have mentioned that before, sir. We men of business who serve a house are not our own masters. We have to think of the house more than ourselves. And what is happening here is Mr. Carton, he's kind of teasing, kind of nettling, needling Mr. Lorry, sweet old Mr. Lorry the banker. He's trying to kind of pick on him and say, oh, so now you can talk to Mr. Darnay, but yes, you know, but during the trial, you wouldn't do that because you didn't want the bank's reputation to be damaged. He's just being me. I know, I know, rejoined Mr. Carton carelessly. Don't be nettled, Mr. Lorry. You're as good as another, I have no doubt. Better, I guess, not. And indeed, sir, pursued Mr. Lorry, not minding him. I really don't know what you have to do with the matter. If you'll excuse me, as very much your elder for saying so, I really don't know that it is your business. Business? Bless you, I have no business, said Mr. Carton. It is a pity you have not, sir. I think so, too. If you had, 
pursued Mr. Lorry, perhaps you would attend to it. Lord love you, no, I shouldn't, said Mr. Carton. Well, sir, cried Mr. Lorry, thoroughly heated by his indifference, business is a very good thing and a very respectable thing. And, sir, if business imposes its restraints and its silences and impediments, Mr. Darnay, as a young gentleman of generosity, knows how to make allowance for that circumstance. Mr. Darnay, good night. God bless you, sir. I hope you have been this day preserved for a prosperous and happy life. Share that. Okay, so in the next paragraph, I want you to underline or circle the word that is hyphenated, barrister. Do you see that? B-A-R dash at the end of the first line. Circle barrister. And then with your green pen right above that, I want you to write this note. Barrister is a synonym of A-T-T-Y, period. What's that mean? Synonym of Addy. What's an Addy? Yes, good job. I think this is the first class where anyone all day long has known that. It does mean attorney. Is that you, Anna? You got it too? You in Brooklyn? Good. This word means attorney. If you drive around Huntsville Courthouse, you will see more than one sign that says A-T-T-Y at law, because that is the legal abbreviation for attorney. You know, I'm always trying to teach you extra things because I want you to be smart. Okay. Well, perhaps a little angry with himself, as well as with the barrister, Mr. Lorry bustled into the chair and was carried off to Telson's. Underline Carson, Carson who, who smelt of port, port wine and, and did, did not, not appear, appear to be quite, quite sober, sober, laughed then and turned to Darnay. Okay, so this is the guy who's been in court all day long with his hands in his pocket, looking up at the ceiling because he's so bored and doesn't want to be there. So when did he have a chance to drink wine and to get uh, a little tipsy? It says he's not sober. He smells of port wine. I thought he'd been in court all day. When could he have possibly found something to drink? Before what? During the trial, he's sitting there at the table. What recess? During court, they have a You know how they recess? They didn't have a reason. They didn't have a reason. No. Uh, maybe we could ask Tommy. Maybe we could ask Tommy. It's just ended right now. Oh, Did he like sneak it? Yeah. No, he he was was maybe someone he threw wine on him. Oh, is it because is it like wine was on the Oh, no, no. oh, when the wine. That's what I was thinking. No, no, no. no. That, no, no. that was in Paris. No. No. Five years ago. Was it Paris? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, my God. God. <laughs> okay, this is not meant to be a hard question. What are you talking about? This is not. When is the only time? Well, let's see. When was the bathroom? But <laughs> 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 he was in the bathroom. He got one hour. Yeah, but he pulled out the flask out of his <laughs> Okay, here we go. This is a strange chance that throws you and me together. This must be a strange night for you, standing alone here with your counterpart, counterpart on these street stones. Underline counterpart because you remember that's like doppelganger. Dickens wants you to remember that these two guys physically look a lot alike. But that's where all similarity ends, as you will see. I hardly have seen yet returned Charles Darnay to belong to this world again. I don't wonder at it. It's not so long since you were pretty far advanced on your way to another. You speak faintly. I begin to think I am faint. Then why the devil don't you dine? I dined myself while those numbskulls were deliberating which world you should belong to, this or some other. Let me show you the nearest tavern to dine well at. Roy? Taylor? When they were deciding the verdict. When who was? The court. The, the court? The jury. The jury. Yes. The jury. Good the jury. job. That's what the piece of candy. Do you want peppermint or chocolate? Chocolate. Okay. His arm through his arm. He took him down Ludgate Hill to Fleet Street. And so up a covered way into a tavern. 
Here they were shown into a little room where Charles Downey was soon recruiting his strength with a good plain dinner and good wine. While Carton sat opposite to him at the same table with his separate bottle of port before him and his fully half insolent, insolent. Mouth upon him. Okay, so if you don't know already what insolent means, it means smart aleck. And so these two are going to have dinner, and you're going to see that Carton speaks very smart eloquently to him. And also, did you know that Charles Darnay is having his dinner in a glass of wine? And then there's Carton, who is having what for dinner? A glass of wine. Not a glass. A wine. Oh. Exactly. He's already tipsy, and you're going to see he is a heavy drinker. He's not done with this model either. You know, I'm just saying that he is a heavy drinker. You feel yet that you belong to this terrestrial scheme again, Mr. Darnay? I am frightfully confused regarding time and place, but I am so far mended as to feel that. It must be an immense satisfaction. He said, he said it bitterly. bitterly. And filled up his glass again, which was a large one. As to me, the greatest desire I have is to forget that I belong to it. Undermine that sentence. As to me, the greatest desire I have is to forget that I belong to it, to forget that I'm alive. Listen for what you can find is the only thing in life that gives him pleasure. It has no good in it for me, except wine like this, nor I for it. So we're not much alike in that particular. Indeed, I begin to think we are not much alike in any particular, you and I. So what's the only thing that gives him pleasure is drinking. That's exactly right. Good job. Confused by the emotion of the day and feeling his being there. About the same age as Darnay. No. It's 45. This this tall, good-looking guy. How old is he? No. Oh, 25. 25. So Carton is about the same age. Drunk? The drunk. Drunk guy. Not so Like he's already an uncle. Right. And would y'all all sit like a scholar, Anna? Over there, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, is it possible for somebody to be 25 years old and be an alcoholic? Yes. 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 Uh, very college students. College oh, I don't know. You know, they drink a lot and party a lot, but are they alcoholics? No. Oh, oh, it's really irresponsible. Like, three cases of 24 packs of beer, so we consider an alcoholic. That is not true. I don't know what source you were looking at, but <laughs> it just so happens we're going to have an article of the Wall week. Street. Over with this double of course to okay, I, to be agreed, yeah, underline Charles Darnay was at a loss how to answer. Finally, okay. he answered not at all. Uh, underline double of course deportment. Do you see it? Double, you know, it's capitalized. That's important. That's like, look at this. That's a reminder. This is the doppelganger. We have the 25 year old Charles Darnay. And we'll just say the 25-year-old Sidney Carton, they look alike, but boy, they're completely different. Course deportment. Deportment means conduct or behavior. Course means rude. And boy, is he ever. Now your dinner is done, Carton presently said. Why don't you call a health, Mr. Darnay? Why don't you give your toast? What health? What toast? Why, it's on the tip of your tongue. It ought to be, it must be, I'll swear it's there. Miss Manette, then. Miss Manette, then. Looking his companion full in the face while he drank the toast, Carton flung his glass over his shoulder against the wall where it shivered to pieces, then rang the bell and ordered in another. That's a fair young lady to hand her a coach in the dark, Mr. Darnay, he said, filling his new goblet. A slight frown. And a laconic, yes, were the answer. That's a fair young lady to be pitied by and wept for by. How does it feel? Is it worth being tried for one's life to be the object of such sympathy and compassion? Mr. Darnay? Again, Darnay answered not a word. She was mightily pleased to have your message when I gave it her. Not that she showed she was pleased, but I suppose she was. Okay, I want you to put a bracket 
where we just ended all the way up to where that started with looking his companion full in the face. Do you see that? Bracket that whole section in red. And then with your green pen, I want you to write this note above the blue line. Carton, you can abbreviate C if you want. It's just right here on the side. Carton envies Lucy's concern for Darnay. Can you tell that he was a little jealous that that pretty girl who is obviously um, too high of character for him to ever get, that she was concerned for Darnay? Yes, dear. Where did the bracket end? Uh, where we just ended, which was, but I suppose she was. Okay. Yes. Uh, what? For Darnay. The illusion serves as a timely reminder to Darnay that this disagreeable companion had, of his own free will, assisted him in the strait of the day. What he means by that is, at this moment, he remembers, oh my goodness, I haven't told this man thank you for saving my life because he was the one that thought of the similarity and you know, wanted to paper up. So he's about to tell him, thank you for doing that and watch how this jerk responds. Uh, he turned the dialogue to that point and thanked him for it. I neither want any thanks nor married any, was the careless rejoinder. It was nothing to do in the first place. And I don't know why I did it in the second. Mr. Darnay, let me ask you a question. Willingly, and a small return for your good offices. Do you think I particularly like you? Now, you know, he's not trying to make a move on this guy. He is just saying it like, <laughs> do you even think that I think that you're anything special, like that I care about you? I hope you're getting it. It's yeah. kind of hard to articulate. <laughs> Really, Mr. Cotton, returned the other, oddly disconcerted, I have not asked myself the question. But ask yourself the question now. You, you have, have acted, acted as, as if you, you do, do. But I don't think you do. But I don't think you do. So, when he says, do you think I like you or care about you at all? Darnay says, well, you have acted as if you do, but I don't think you do. Write with your green pen, good manners. What a very tactful way to answer such a rude question. Good manners. I don't think I do, said Carton. <laughs> I begin to have a very good opinion of your understanding. You're a smart guy. Nevertheless, pursued Darnay, rising to ring the bell, there is nothing in that I hope to prevent my calling the reckoning and our parting without ill blood on either side. And you underlined reckoning and write in teeny tiny letters right above that word reckoning. That means bill. So Dar the bill, the check for the meal. Darnay is basically going to say, well, hey, I'd like to buy your dinner since you helped me out, and then we'll just part ways. And watch what Carton does when he finds out that that uh, Darnay is going to pay for the whole meal. Carton rejoining, nothing in life, Darnay ran. Do you call the whole reckoning? Like, are you going to pay Carton. for it all? On his answering in the affirmative, then bring me another pint of this same wine drawer and come and wake me at time. Yeah. The bill being paid, Charles Darnay rose and wished him good night. Without returning the wish, Carton rose too, with something of a threat of defiance in his manner, and said, A last word, Mr. Darnay. You think I am drunk? So he's still kneeling, he's still picking the fight. Underline, you think I am drunk? And I want you to write with your green pen. That calls for a statement. That's what STMT stands for. That calls for a statement of judgment to be made. And some of us who come from families where there are drinkers, and usually this discussion will be taking place when it's time to get in the car and go home after someone has been drinking. This can start World War III. When the person says, you think I'm drunk? Well, hmm, it can go <laughs> downhill pretty quickly. And it calls for a judgment to be made. But re but notice how Darnay responds, underline, I think you've been drinking. And write with your green pen, that's a statement of fact. 
He's trying to politely avoid escalation. Uh, I think you have been drinking, Mr. Cotton. Think? You know I have been drinking. Since I must say so, I know it. Then you shall likewise know why. I am a disappointed drudge, sir. I care for no man on earth, and no man on earth cares for me. Okay, underline that very famous quotation. I am a disappointed drudge. I care for no man on earth, and no man on earth cares for me. Someone asked me this morning, what does drudge mean? And I said, it means loser. He's saying, I'm a loser. I don't care about anybody in the whole world, and nobody in the whole world cares about me. That's much to be regretted. You might have used your talents better. Maybe so, Mr. Darnay, maybe not. Don't let your sober face elate you, however. You don't know what it may come to. Underline that. When Darnay says, well, that's too bad. You know, it's too bad you didn't make something of yourself. Underline, don't let your sober face elate you. However, you don't know what it may come to. And put an F. What do you think the F in the margin is going to stand for? Oh, yes. Oh, no. Because he's saying, oh, yeah, you will let the right circumstances happen to you and see what you end up like. Oh, no. Oh, that mouse. I didn't wiggle it and it fell asleep. Oh. Who particularly like the man? Oh, oh only... rats. I'm going to read it. This is good. When he was left alone, this strange being took up a candle, went to a glass against the wall, and surveyed himself minutely in it. What that means is Sidney Horton picks up this candle off the table and holds it and looks in the mirror, and he says such awfully ugly things to himself. Do you particularly like the man? He's talking to his own face. He muttered at his own image. Why should you particularly like a man who resembles you? There is nothing in you to like. You know that. Ah, oh, confound you. What a change you have made in yourself. A good reason for talking to a man that, underline, he shows you what you have fallen away from and what you might have been. Change places with him and would you have been looked at by those blue eyes as he was? and commiserated by that agitated face as he was, come on and have it out in plain words, undermine. You hate the fellow. He resorted to his pint of wine for consolation, drank it all in a few minutes, and fell asleep on his arms with his hair straggling over the table in a long winding sheet in the candle, dripping down upon him. <laughs> you feel sorry for this guy? A little. Oh, don't. No, don't. Girls, don't follow. Don't I follow don't, for I don't like him. <laughs> I don't like when people talk about him. I know, I know, I know. Is it a